It is very bright up here. Good afternoon, everyone. I am not John Balbus, um, but I am very happy to be here. There are, are two, can I just click? There are two main federal activities that John Balbus wanted to point out today with this talk. The first is delivery of the 2014, uh, the third national climate assessment earlier this year, which uh, included a chapter devoted to health impacts of climate change. The second is a new USGCRP special assessment on climate change and health. So we'll get a little bit into how that fits into our sustained assessment process at USGCRP, the scope of that report, what they're doing for engagement, and then the timeline for completion of that next report. So why do we care about health and climate change? Why is this something that's risen to, to prominence in the administration? Because there are a number of climate-related factors that have a number of environmental factors that then lead to a myriad of health effects. So that in itself implies that there are a number of new models required, new ways of thinking about how to disambiguate the effects and solve these problems. Before we all get dizzy. Um, so the third national climate assessment was the first major product that we wanted to talk about. It was released earlier this year. Uh, it had 30 chapters. It was a major report that, that Fred mentioned and showed you how to navigate. And chapter nine was all about health. The chapter had two convening lead authors, six lead authors, and an additional eight contributing authors from uh, federal agencies, academia, and other organizations as well. It was one of the largest author teams for any chapter in the report. The, uh, the chapter contained four key messages about health impacts, and I'll, I'll read them briefly as we go through, uh, and then show some of the images from the chapter that are, have been widely used for communicating about health impacts in the recent months. First, climate change threatens human health and well-being in many ways, including impacts from extreme weather events, wildfire, decreased air quality, threats to mental health, and illnesses transmitted by food, water, and disease carriers such as mosquitoes and ticks. Some of these impacts are already underway in the U.S. Uh, the documentation for this shows climate change is project projected to worsen asthma and some modeling results that show projected increases in asthma rates in the Northeast. Changes in the ragweed pollen season, which influences the allergies and the rate of allergies. Wildfire smoke increases in wildfires and increases in the wildfire smoke that can travel long distances and have health effects at uh, very distant locations. This shows fires in Canada having impacts in Baltimore, Maryland. Tick habitat is projected to change dramatically, and with it, the incidence of Lyme disease that is carried by ticks. Uh, you see the red in 2080 on the far right map is a lot greater than the present. And then harmful blooms of algae, algae as well. Are, uh, this is Lake Erie and is one of the, uh, the great lakes that is prone to having uh, harmful algal blooms. The second key message from the chapter is that the most vulnerable are at the most risk. Climate change will, absent other changes, amplify some of the existing health threats that the nation now faces. Certain people and communities are especially vulnerable, including children, the elderly, the sick, the poor, and some communities of color. To illustrate this, it includes some graphs that show the elements of vulnerability to climate change, including poverty rates, uh, diabetes rates, uh, obesity rates, and asthma rates. Another example is the Katrina diaspora, or the number of people displaced by Katrina. And this map shows the counties that they relocated to after the Katrina event. The third key message is that prevention provides protection. So public health actions, especially preparedness and prevention, can do much to protect people from some of the impacts of climate change. Early action provides the largest health benefits. As threats increase, our ability to adapt to future changes may be limited. And the final key message is that responses have multiple benefits. So responding to climate change provides opportunities to improve human health and well-being across many sectors, including energy, agriculture, and transportation. Many of these strategies offer a variety of benefits, protecting people while combating climate change and providing other societal benefits. So the report was released to, to a very wide coverage. Uh, it was broadcast across major television networks. Uh, there were statements of support received from major professional societies, including the American Public Health Association and the American Lung Association, as well as other health organizations, as well as a number of politicians and uh, even Stephen Colbert. 
Uh, statistics, 154,000 people reviewed the report in the first 24 hours, and we had over a million views within the first month. It's been downloaded over 375,000 times to date, and the health chapter is one of the most downloaded chapters. Uh, it's also, it's one of the most visited chapters, and it's also one of the most downloaded, downloaded over 3,000 times, the individual chapter. So as Fred mentioned, we are working to implement a sustained assessment process. So turn this uh, vast report creating machine into something that doesn't just ramp up and create a report and drop off the face, but uh, to facilitate continuous engagement with stakeholders to understand what decision making needs are, to uh, continuously collect information, uh, to engage across reason, regions and sectors, and to enable new information insights to be synthesized as they emerge. So the first major special report of this process is a report focused on climate change and human health through USUCRP. The climate and health assessment is motivated by a number of things. First, it was called out as a major area of need in the President's Climate Action Plan in June of 2013. Health and climate has also been identified as a priority by a number of federal agencies, uh, including the USUCR, the 13 agencies that are members of USUCRP. And this, this report is also an opportunity to leverage multiple analytical activities that are going on at several agencies that are related to climate and health. So it will provide a very comprehensive and evidence-based report when it's finally released, and it is uh, being tracked very closely through, uh, through the agencies. The goal of the report is to inform policymakers, decision makers, and others. Uh, the scope, it will be a very comprehensive update to the 2008 synthesis and assessment product. If you're familiar with the, the SAPs that were uh, in the middle of the 2000s, uh, it'll be a very comprehensive update building on that one, and it'll also update the NCA3 health chapter that was released this year. It includes a, a great deal of new science, as well as a, a thorough assessment of the current literature. There's a very broad author team that's assessing current research and developing some new modeling studies. And the focus is clearly on impact quantification. Uh, the report will not discuss mitigation, adaptation, economic valuation, or policy, uh, similar to um, other, other reports, we've found that it, by focusing on quantification, you don't turn off anyone who wants to know about the other things. So in the climate and health assessment, there are nine chapters and introduction. Then these four chapters in the middle in blue are ones that include novel modeling. So new modeling studies have been done. Uh, new quantifications have been done for these studies. There, the four chapters at the end, the white chapters, are those that I uh, don't have any new modeling associated for this, but are a thorough, still include a thorough assessment of the state of knowledge. So these are four papers. I tried to fit all this, well, whoever made the slides tried to fit it all on one page, but uh, these are the four chapters that have new modeling studies, and these have all been submitted for publication. So these are, should all be in the literature soon uh, on thermal extremes, air quality impacts, vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, and waterborne and foodborne disease. So if you're curious or looking for those, we can get you the full titles and the names of the authors. There have been a number of opportunities for public engagement in the development of this report. Uh, a Federal Register notice was published this year asking for input on the draft prospectus for the report, asking for nominations for authors and contributors, and then asking for scientific information as well. There was a public forum held in March that uh, had allowed people a, an opportunity to comment in person on those things. And an, another Federal Register notice uh, expected in the spring will formally announce a 60-day public comment period. That 60-day public comment period will be simultaneous with a, an, a review by the National Academies, a National Research Council. Because this report is considered a highly influential scientific assessment, it will have a separate panel of the National Academies to conduct a review, and simultaneously the 60 days of federal uh, of public comment, excuse me, then the assessment will, after those comments have been addressed and responded to, the assessment will undergo interagency review and clearance. So just to finish, a brief timeline for this uh, upcoming report. Uh, the final versions are being finalized right now for delivery to USGCRP. There will be a Federal Register notice and a public comment period expected this coming March to May 2015, along with the NRC peer review. Then we expect that the report will be finalized and finally launched in March of 2016, so a little over a year away. We do have 
we do have some time for some questions, if there are questions uh, for Glynis or uh, Fred or I, who are also on staff at USGCRP, can also try to answer them. So. Uh, no questions? Um, should we do some questions about risky business? Um, maybe we can take this opportunity if there were questions about the first presentation, since we ran out of time there. Um, give them a couple questions if you have them. Okay. And there is a microphone here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Aaron, is it a technical question? Okay. I'm unqualified to ask technical questions about economic analyses. Um, I, was, I was actually curious about, um, my name is Aaron Hurtis, I'm with the Union of Concerned Scientists. I, I was curious about the reception on the Risky Business Report, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Uh, one of the things that, that I found in looking at the media coverage of the report was that um, the, the audiences that uh, were getting spoken to about the report were really politically diverse in a way that I hadn't seen out of a lot of climate-related reports, um, yeah. and a lot of the coverage seemed bipartisan, nonpartisan. I wonder if you can talk about, um, um, talk a little bit more about that in the context of how the report was received and conveyed to the public. Sure, that's a great question. Um, we, I mean, we really, as I said, designed it so that that would happen, and, and that was not an accident. We spent a lot of time thinking that through, and you know, unfortunately, uh, we had to do the whole thing outside of Washington because it would have been seen as partisan if we'd done it in Washington and, and outside of the traditional environmental community for the same reason. We, we did find that the coverage was very nonpartisan. And I'll say two things about it. First, we got a huge range of coverage, and uh, we got really, really good articles in, as I said, like the Financial Times and, um, and The Economist. And one of the things that was most important about that coverage was that because this report was in the language of risk assessment, the like very understandable investor business language, it was really accessible immediately to a lot of business reporters in a way that a lot of sort of pure climate science work is not. And so we found that there was a, an approach by those reporters that was very kind of business risk assessment focused, which was great. So we, we wrote it in an accessible way. Um, and the, the thing to know about it, if you go to riskybusiness.org, you'll see we have a website that's very interactive. And then if you want to go in further, we have a 35-page, high-level, very image-heavy report that I wrote. And then we have a 250-page underlying research assessment that the Rhodian people wrote, which is the American Climate Perspective. So we had many access points, which was also important. Um, so the coverage was really diverse, and I think that that's why, uh, because of the, the tone. Um, we also gave a lot of credit to companies that are already doing risk assessment, and the companies really like that. So in terms of other follow-up that's not media-focused, I've been spending most of my time for the last six months since the launch uh, doing high-level CEO-level meetings with uh, industry folks by industry and by region. So we just did one with ag trade association leaders in the Midwest. We did one with the American Actuarial Association and climate scientists. We've been doing very specific meetings, and those meetings essentially, because we're able to come in and say, you guys understand climate risk, you, do, you understand risk, you do it all the time, you're experts on risk assessment, talk to us, like, let's talk to you about what we did and then get your thoughts about how we could have done it better, what you could do with this. We're starting the conversation with them at a level where they're the leaders and they're already like, it's a very positive conversation. Instead, and the ag leaders will say this, everybody comes into meetings with the agriculture industry saying, you guys are X percent of the problem. Or they come in saying, will you sign this letter like supporting a carbon tax? And neither of those is a very good way in with these guys. A much better way is, you're already leaders on thinking about climate risk. What could you be doing more? So that was a long answer, but it was a really big part of how we thought through the whole project. And again, I would just say to any of you guys doing this kind of work, the communications aspect of this was huge. 50% of our budget went to communications, and it was extremely important that, it, that we did that. And uh, for all the reasons we just talked about, it was very intentional, the way that we framed this and the way we talked about it. Um, and I don't think it would have gotten that reception otherwise. When you say communication, you mean yeah. within the group that was doing the work or outside? Um, really outside. So we, we spent, uh, we, had our, we have our own communications team at Next Generation. We also worked with the communications teams of all of the risk committee members. 
um, every draft we did. So we had we had a variety of meetings with those guys where we they saw our outline, they saw our not the research, which was independent, but they saw the outline of what we were going to put in the major report. They worked on our talking points with us. Um, so we had a, a we had a really interesting meeting in New York that was the entire expert review board combined with the entire risk committee talking about the underlying science and analysis and then the high level communications and talking points. We hired a PR firm. I mean, it was very very communications heavy. And then we did, if you look at our website, it's very interactive. Um, so we designed the website to be as accessible as possible. But every single thing we did, we went over with a fine tooth comb in terms of the framing that we used. You won't see the words human induced climate change anywhere, for instance, because we did a risk assessment assuming the science. So we didn't want to have a fight over who was causing the problem. We wanted to assume the science and move on to the risks and the economic impacts. Um, that kind of thing seems really small, but it's actually really important. So thanks for the question.